Well, welcome once again. This is session two uh, in our, uh, life, our life school class, our Forerunner School class. Forerunner School is a ministry of life school. In our Forerunner School class, understanding the Forerunner call. And this session two is, prepare, is titled Preparing the Way for Christ's Return, for Christ's Second Coming. Uh, and that's what we want to talk about in this session is the fact that we are talking in this class and in this school about end time forerunners. Um, so we'll look at that here in just a, a minute. Uh, we're, we're talking about forerunners who will, uh, are activated now and will prepare the way for the Lord's second coming, a uh, specific uh, aspect of a forerunner call. So uh, let me pray and then we want to get into the teaching about this. Uh, Father, we once again ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we thank you that you are the God in charge, the Most High God, and we pray that you would anoint this uh, teaching uh, today and that you would really just let me be a voice for your heart, for your burden, for your uh, message to be spoken to all who are gathered here, either online or in person. So we thank you, Father, for that. and ask that you will have your way as we teach this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, I said this in the last session, but I want to just reiterate as we begin that we're not trying to make this a, a teaching session or a preaching session in the sense that you just, you're just you encouraged and you're exhorted and you're challenged and you go away, but you don't really grasp everything that is being communicated. Uh, to the point that you could be a voice yourself. We are, we are, this is a forerunner school, and so I really want, to, really want to encourage you to dig into all these scriptures. Uh, we had a number of them in the last session talking about uh, Elijah and, and Ahab and Jezebel and Jeroboam and a lot of Old Testament scriptures. This will be more focused on uh, just some other passages, but I want you to, to really dig into these things because uh, if you're going to become a voice, you need the information in your heart. It's not information doesn't change us. It's impartation and revelation of the Lord that changes us and transforms us. But information is a part of that. Information and knowledge uh, helps us to be able to be that voice. And you'll not get it unless you really put the energy into studying the scriptures yourself, meditating upon the uh, the messages and the scriptures and the teachings. So I really want to encourage you to do that. Uh, it's really, it really will be important uh, if you want to really, if your heart is to really be a forerunner in this, in this uh, time in which we live, it, it's really necessary and, and really essential, in my opinion, to dig into the scriptures here. So anyway, with that, again, like I said in the last session, we're the two foundational scriptures. We're going to do dig into the first one uh, primarily this time in this session, but the first one comes from Malachi chapter 4, uh, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible or great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Uh, that's the first ver verse that's foundational. And the second one is from Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And he, speaking of John the Baptist, will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he will go, who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Those are the two foundational scriptures. And in this session and in the next three, uh, after that, so the, you know, session two through five, we'll be looking at these, uh, these two scriptures, verses. We'll look primarily today at Malachi chapter four, and then in the next uh, three sessions, we'll kind of dissect Luke chapter one, 16 and 17, to try to understand what God is meaning when he's saying, turn people back to the Lord their God, what he's meaning when he's talking about make ready a people prepared for the Lord, and what he means by the spirit and the power of Elijah. So we'll kind of go into those uh, in, in detail in subsequent sessions. But in this session, we want to talk about 
draw primarily from Malachi chapter 4 and 5. And the point I want to try to make uh, in this is that we are talking about end-time forerunners. We're talking about end-time forerunners. It's uh, really important. We're not just talking about uh, forerunners in general. I mean, there have been forerunners throughout history, probably starting with Noah. Uh, he, was a, he was a forerunner. We, you know, you also see Joseph and uh, M Moses as a forerunner. John the Baptist was a forerunner. Uh, there have been forerunners throughout history. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a forerunner. Martin Luther was a forerunner. Uh, there are a number, you know, number of forerunners during, throughout history. And those were, those were forerunners to turn people back to God in critical times. And that's, uh, that's really, really important. It's been very important. But what I'm saying is what we believe the Lord is saying to us is to prepare in time forerunners. But it's important that we can support that in the scriptures, that we can really understand that God is raising up forerunners in the end times, that, will, that the forerunner company, whether it's one generation or a few short years or a generation or even multiple generations, whatever it may be. You know, Noah, uh, Jesus said it'll be like the days of Noah when he comes back, Matthew 24. And Noah, when he was building the ark, uh, preach, was a preacher of righteousness as a forerunner for 120 years. And so uh, we're not setting a date that we're, the Lord's going to come back, uh, you know, next year or in 10 years or whenever. But what we're saying is that this movement uh, is an end-time movement. It's an end-time movement, and the movement itself will ultimately culminate with the second coming of Christ, whenever that is. I'm not trying to set dates here, but that that will be uh, the case. Um, I want to start, though, talking about it's really important that you know that you're called as a forerunner and that you have insight and can support the whole issue of forerunners. Let me just tell you a little bit about our journey uh, into the forerunner call. Uh, I was called into the ministry in 1984. I started full-time at a traditional Baptist church, and it was a great Baptist church, and we were blessed by being there. But then the Lord put in our heart there was more than what we were uh, knew at that point in time. And about the same point in time, he called us to start the church that we uh, uh, pastored and pastored for 25 or so years and eventually turned it over to our oldest son, Brian, um, but in 1991, we knew that we did not want to uh, be a traditional church. We knew that we wanted to, uh, to be something that was in our heart, but we really weren't sure what it was. And so we pursued every movement that we knew uh, to pursue. We pursued the healing movement. We pursued the prophetic movement. We pursued the laughing movement and virtually anything that had any sort of external display of signs, wonders, and powers, mighty deeds. We were, we were pursuing those things. And there was some measure of success, but uh, for the most part, we were not able to fit in to any of those streams. Every time we would gather with other pastors and other churches who were in those streams, just something wasn't quite right. We wasn't, it wasn't who we were. Uh, and so we started the church, like I said, in 1991. And so by 95 or so, Donna and I, my wife and I, were at the point where, Lord, why, if this is what you've called us to, why did you call us into the ministry? Um, we were content in business and uh, had a real nice little comfortable life. Uh, doing that before we went into the ministry. Why did you do it to, to lead us into this? It was kind of a, a desperation cry. And that's when uh, we began to be introduced to the forerunner call. This was in, say, 1996. Uh, Mike Bickle was beginning to talk about it in 1996 at the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. He was beginning to speak about it. And, and the Lord connected us really miraculously with Noel Mann and Di Mann from Australia who uh, had become major, uh, really great friends over the years with us. 
Uh, but he began to come to our church in 1996. And we didn't really know him when he first came. We'd never met him until he came and ministered at the church. And he began to talk about forerunners. He talked about the spirit and power of Elijah. He talked about things like Revelation chapter 12, the man-child. He talked about uh, the queen of heaven, the spirit of Jezebel, and, the, and the, 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 the world ruler of the queen of heaven, just all sorts of things, becoming a house of prayer. And we didn't know anything about any of that, but it resonated with us that this was who we were. And so then in 1997, a year after this, we, the Lord sent us to Kansas City to the Passion for Jesus conference that Mike Bickle was leading. And he had a message that year about the invitation to be forerunners. And the Lord was just pounding in our hearts knowing that this was our call. So we couldn't get to the altar fast enough to say yes, that we wanted to be forerunners. And this was in 1997. And so we were really excited about it, very excited about it. And we came back uh, to our church, our local church uh, that we're still a part of, and we began to share our excitement about forerunners. And I was really surprised uh, how many people in our fellowship uh, at that point in time did not share our excitement, let me put it that way, did not share our excitement in the forerunner call. Uh, many opposed it, uh, or uh, let me say many, some opposed it, uh, argumentatively opposed it, and said they didn't even believe there was such a thing as a forerunner call. Uh, and then others didn't really oppose it, but I think they were really just trusting that we had heard from the Lord more than they really understood it or wanted it uh, 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 to be. And at that point in time, I, here's where I was. I knew this, this is what I'm called to be. I knew, I knew it. Donna knew it. We knew this is what we were called to be. This is what our church is called to be. But I didn't have the ability uh, to articulate and to expound and to explain and to support the idea that there is a forerunner call, that there is a, uh, a group of people being raised up in, in this hour to prepare the way for Jesus' second coming, whatever that may be. I was not able to really communicate it. I knew it in my heart. I knew Luke 1, 16 and 17, and I knew that's me. I'm, I say yes to that. But I wasn't able to support it. And so what I'm going to say is as we get into, in this session and the next few sessions, really the rest of the, this class, I really want to encourage you to dig in and, and get in your own heart the understanding that you're called as a forerunner, but more than that even, the ability to communicate it to other people, to support it. Because what's happened, you will find, probably a lot of you have already found this, that you're heading up, you're swimming upstream while the rest of the church is coming downstream. And, you're, and they are saying one thing and you're saying something totally different uh but it's anointed of god i'm not saying it's not god it is absolutely god it's anointed of god but you'll get resistance and you'll get dissension you'll get opposition uh and so it's really important that you really dig into this we're in this session and in the next few we're going to be really digging into a lot of scriptures to support uh the fact that we're right, talking about end time forerunners who are called in the spirit and the power of elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord by turning the hearts of the people back to God and, and by turning the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. So we'll be looking at all of that in a lot of depth. And I want to encourage you to get it in your heart. So if somebody says, I don't even believe there is a forerunner call, you'll be able to say to them, yes, there is. Here's the support. Da -da, da -da, da -da. Point by point, precept by precept. So in this session... What we're looking at is to say, just look at the idea, uh, the scriptural basis that we are talking about in time, in time forerunners, in time forerunners, not just forerunners because they've been through them throughout history, but in time forerunners. Now, as we start, let me explain to you what we mean by the end times. When we're talking about the end times, we are not just talking 
about the last three and a half years of the church age. We're not just talking about the last seven years of the church age. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of materials out there. Some we agree with and some we probably wouldn't agree with that talk about all the things that are happening in the last three and a half or the last seven years of the church age. We're not, when we say end times, we're not just talking about that. Now, the end times would include that, yes, but we're not, but not just that. Uh, there are a couple places in Scripture that would support uh, that in terms of the end times. One would be that um, in Revelation 17, uh, the Apostle John spoke about eight, king, eight different kingdoms. Uh, five had already passed. By the time he wrote, at the time he wrote, five had passed. One was, which was the Roman Empire. Then a seventh was coming, and then the seventh would be taken over by the Antichrist, which would be an eighth. Now, the seventh kingdom, in our uh, evaluation, has not yet come yet. It's still, still future, although there are a lot of things going, uh, being put into place which will ultimately be that seventh kingdom. A lot of disagreement on what the seventh kingdom is. I, what we believe, whether this is literally the seventh kingdom or events that will be a part of that, is that there is a, a new world order, a globalist uh, type of government being... Uh, uh, spoken of and created behind the scenes uh, that would include many of the major and, and most of probably if not all the major nations of the of the earth and that is being formed right now but that's part of the the end time uh, uh, agenda part of the it's an end time thing even things working with the UN and some of their agendas the 2030 initiative that they have and other things would be a part of that um, there's also in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talked about certain things being only the beginning of birth pangs. Uh, and we'll talk about that some more in some other sessions. But the birth pangs, uh, you know, will take longer than just that three and a half years. In other words, really, the birth pangs lead up to the birth that will be in that seven or three and a half year in time period, and we'll talk about that in other, in other places. But we're we're speaking about a, a time. When we say end times, we're speaking about a time that is now. Like Jesus said in Matthew 24, that the days of Noah. These are like the days of Noah, and Noah built the ark uh, to protect people uh, when the floods came. He he built the ark. And it took him 120 years to do it. Uh, and he preached righteousness, turning, trying to turn people back to God throughout that 120-year period. Uh, so uh, we're talking about an extended period of time. We, uh, we don't know how long it will be, but we do believe it's an extended period of time, uh, certainly decade or decades uh, is what we believe. Uh, and possibly even generations. I, we don't really know, but we know that we are in the end times. We're believing the, that we are now in the end times and that the end times will ultimately culminate in the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ, and that forerunners are called for that period. So I wanted to define end times before we get into supporting scripturally that this is a, the forerunner call that we're talking about. It's an end time call of end time forerunners. Uh, we're living in those days now. That's, that's the main point from what I've said so far. We are living in the end times now. It's not something in the future. <coughs> it's not something that's going to, that we're getting ready for that might take place in 30 years from now. We are in those days now. And God is raising up forerunners now. It's not... Get prepared over the next decade so you can be used. I think there will be an increasing use of forerunners. There will be an increase uh, of the way that God will use forerunners in the in the years and decades uh, ahead. But it's a now call. It is a now. It's, it's now Elijah, like we talked about in the last session, First uh, Kings 17:1. It is now now Elijah. So anyway, that's the. I want to clarify that as we get into now supporting 
that what God is talking to us about is end time forerunners anointed in the spirit and the power uh, of Elijah. So let's talk about that. We'll look at, begin to look at scriptural, the scriptural basis for that. Now, going back to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, uh, it reads this, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. The great and terrible day of the Lord. Remember, no, notice that God will send Elijah or the spirit of Elijah before the coming of the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is a term that's used a lot in Scripture, and it refers to the second coming of Christ and the events surrounding the second coming of Christ. The, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord occurs 18 times in the Scriptures, uh, in the, mainly the prophetic writings, or maybe totally the prophetic literature, most often in the books of Joel and Zephaniah. And, but the phrase on that day, which also refers to the day of the Lord, uh, re refers to the, to the of the day of, which refers to the day of the Lord on that day, uh, ha takes place two, or occurs 208 times in the scriptures. So you see that the day of the Lord are, are similar phrases that mean uh, the day uh, of the Lord refer to the second coming, of Christ. All of those are talking about the second coming. If you look up day of the Lord and look up where it's talking about, they're talking about uh, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a, um, it, it's a, a day to represent the, the uh, coming of judgment on the earth and of turning, uh, re changing the earth to where Christ rules and it's related to many aspects, but it's related to the second coming and many uh, ways. So that's the first support. This is an end time call. He's going to send Elijah before the day of the Lord. Uh, and now we see this uh, uh, reinforced in Malachi chapter 3. Let's, let's look at that. Let me read it. I'm just reading it, uh, quoting it from my notes rather than taking the time to turn to these passages. But this is from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, He is coming. Christ, he, speaking of Christ, is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the very day of his coming and who can, who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and a purifier of sil silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So Malachi is talking about, this is connected to Malachi chapter 4 and 5 where he's going to send Elijah, uh, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord to accomplish, to prepare people so they can endure his coming. The Christ is coming. Uh, now, one thing we need to make sure, you probably know this, but just to make sure we all know it, um, when Malachi wrote this uh, in, in the 5th century uh, B.C., more than 400 years had passed since Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite, you know, the Elijah of 1 Kings, uh, had lived and ministered in the northern kingdom of Israel. So Malachi is prophesying this after Elijah has ministered uh, in the land. So we know he's not talking about the man Elijah. Uh, now, John the Baptist partially fulfilled the prophet, this prophecy of Malachi. Um, you know, we noted Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 17, talking about coming in the spirit and the power uh, of Elijah. Uh, and Jesus confirmed that John did operate in the anointing of Elijah. Uh, Matthew records this. This, uh, this is Matthew 17, verse uh, 11 through 13. And he, Jesus, this is Jesus, answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you, now we'll, we'll deal with Elijah is coming, because this is not talking about John the Baptist here. But this is what I want you to hear. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him 
whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. So what we see, they were the, the, the Jews at that time, they were looking at Malachi's prophecy about, about Elijah coming. And, but Jesus said he did come. He already came. And he came uh, in, in the person of John the Baptist. So we do know that uh, the spirit and the power of Elijah did come with John the Baptist. Luke 1, 17 confirms that uh, as well. So we do know that. And so the, the question is going to arise, well, this was already fulfilled with John the Baptist. Uh, but I say to you, no, it's partially fulfilled with John the Baptist, yes, but not fully fulfilled uh, with John the Baptist. Now, we see this. Uh, with some of Isaiah's prophecies about John the Baptist, it also reinforces the idea of end-time forerunners. Um, we're we're going to look at Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. 40, Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And this is talking about uh, John the Baptist preparing the way uh, of, uh, of the Lord, uh, you know, fulfilling Malachi's prophecy. So we would think, if we stopped there, we would think that it could just be John the Baptist. But then going on, this is Isaiah, still the same chapter, Isaiah 40, uh, verses 9 and 10. It says, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come. So he's tying this ministry of John the Baptist into the second coming. Behold, the Lord God will come with might. Now, Jesus came as a lamb in the first coming, but he's coming as a lion with his second coming. With his arm ruling for him, behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And so this is speaking of the second coming of Christ. Uh, from this, we know that John the Baptist only partially fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy. In addition, as the above passage support, there will be an end-time messenger, forerunners, who prepare the way for Christ's second coming. So we see that. Uh, we, you know, we see it in some of Jesus' words. We see it also uh, in uh, what Isaiah prophesied about John the Baptist and other, and the fulfillment that will come with the second coming. Um, so God will send Elijah again before the second coming of Christ. And we know this because of two reasons, two more reasons we know it. One uh, is because of the reference to the day of the Lord in Malachi chapter 4 and chapter 3. The talk about the day of the Lord, which if you just look at any uh, uh, Bible uh, encyclopedias or whatever, and just do a search on the day of the Lord, you'll see that it's talking about what it's talking about is related to the things around the, the second coming of Christ. Uh, but then there's also another verse of Scripture, we, and we quoted it a minute ago, but I want to go here. Uh, Matthew 17, uh, 11. Find it here. Matthew 17, 11. Okay, here we go. Uh, and he answered the, the, the questions to the Pharisees who were asking, or the disciples were asking. Uh, is Elijah coming? And we're, Elijah is coming, and he will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. This is what we read before, and did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. And so they realized that he was talking about John the Baptist. Okay, but he also says in that same passage, and he says, "But I say to you." Verse 16, uh, I mean, verse 17, verse 11. 
but he said Elijah is coming and will, future, will restore all things. So he said, okay, John the Baptist came, the spirit and power of Elijah came on John the Baptist. It already came. But there's a future, there's another coming of Elijah who will restore all things. Now, I just, this probably goes without saying, but Matthew 412 Matthew 412 now Jesus had just come out of the wilderness temptation at the beginning of his ministry and he says this, he, this is written when he heard when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody if we he withdrew into Galilee uh, so by the time Jesus had started his ministry, John the Baptist had been taken prisoner by Herod. He had been taken into custody. And then if you look at Matthew 14, remember Jesus said, recording in Matthew 17, that Elijah was coming. But if you look at Matthew 14, this is the story of Herod arresting John and putting him to death. And so here's the point. He, Jesus said two things in this Matthew 17 passage. He says, first, that Elijah already came in John the Baptist. But he says, Elijah's going to come again. Now, John the Baptist has already died at this point in time. He's already been martyred at this point in time. And so what is the Lord saying? The Lord's saying there's going to be a coming again of Elijah. It's going to be coming again. It'll be, and it'll be before the, the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Now, and so what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to give you scriptural support to show you that there is a forerunner call, an end time forerunner call that will take place and, and where the spirit and the power of Elijah is upon it before the second coming of Christ. And it's not speaking about totally about John the Baptist. And it's not also speaking about one of the two witnesses. Uh, now, uh, let's see if we, let's look at um, Revelation chapter 11. Because I want you to be able to support this because people will question uh, this call. And, you know, and if you look at Revelation 11, verse 3, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. That's talking about three and a half years. The last uh, three and a half years or three and a half years of the, of the uh, end times. Uh, but look what it says about them. If anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone would desire to harm them in this manner, he must be killed. Verse 6, they have the power to shut up the sky in order that rain may not fall during the days of the prophesying, and they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague as, as often as they desire. Now, if you think about those two witnesses, one of them could turn water into the rivers into blood, and one could shut the heavens so no rain came. Now, who does that sound like? It sounds like Moses, and it sounds like Elijah. Uh, so it doesn't really say specifically, but we could assume that one of those two prophets is Elijah. And so the, the, the question naturally arises then, uh, is, this, is Malachi's prophecy about the second coming, about Elijah being sent before the day of the Lord, the second coming, is that speaking of Revelation 11 where there's one person, the reincarnation of Elijah or the coming back to earth, because remember, Elijah didn't die. He was caught up to heaven. So Elijah, is this Elijah coming back to earth to minister in uh, Israel? And this, is this the only uh, fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy? That's the question that we're trying to ask. I don't, I'm, my answer is no, it's not the only one. But I want you to see this so that in case you are, get questions about it or have questions in your own mind, about it, you will see the, uh, the answer uh, to this. No, well, I say no. This is not the, uh, the only, it may be uh, one of the manifestations of Elijah. It may be the actual Elijah coming back. 
But there's more to that, uh, that, that, that in addition to that. There will also be a worldwide company of believers who minister as end-time forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. There, the, Elijah may, pro, may minister in Jerusalem, but there will be a company anointed with him. And here's some reasons for it. Uh, John the Baptist was needed to turn Israel. I'm talking about why there will be a global company of forerunners anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah that will be on the earth preceding the second coming of Christ. One, here's some reasons for that. Uh, and not just Elijah ministering in Jerusalem during the last few years of the church age. John the Baptist was needed to turn Israel back to God, to turn Israel back to righteousness, and to prepare the way for the Lord in Israel. John's ministry was focused upon Israel because at his first coming, Jesus was coming to Israel. He came to Israel not globally around the world. Initially, it was spread from Israel throughout the known world at that time. And here's some reasons why. Uh, Elijah of Malachi's prophecy, and referred to by Jesus in Matthew 17, refers to a global group of believers in the end times. Jesus said that Elijah, spoken of by Malachi, would restore all things. You know, in Matthew 17, 11, he said, when Elijah will come and he will restore all things. Uh, the restoration of all things will take place on a global scale and take a considerable amount of time and effort. Yeah, you know, I mean, especially those of you that are pastors and you know, if you want to change something in your church, how long it takes to accomplish those kinds of things. It's very slow and very deliberate. And the restoration of all things will be a, will be a slow process. So it, it's, it's not going to be able to be accomplished by one person. Uh, the Elijah described in Malachi restores generations back to the Lord. Elijah will turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. And so you're talking about generational issues that need to be turned back. And those are going to take uh, a lot of people in a lot of places over a long period of time to do that. Uh, period, the, uh, the, a part of the ministry of the end time forerunners will be to turn the disobedient back to the attitude of the righteous. That is, the, the, that is uh, his laws and his word. This is a massive effort that will take place on a global basis since the churches in many instances have drifted far, far from God and devoted uh, in devotion to his ways and his word. It's too extensive for a three and a half year period to accomplish and for one person uh, to accomplish it uh, in, in Israel. And so we're not, and we're not talking about the reincarnation of Elijah coming back to the earth. We may need to make sure we understand that. We're not talking about the reincarnation of Elijah being put in different places of the earth. We're talking about an anointing that was on John the Baptist and that is, being, that is prophesied will come prior to the second coming of Christ. And so that anointing will be a global anointing that will, that will coincide with whatever the two witnesses are doing in Jerusalem and even precede that uh, for uh, decades, years, who knows how long, globally to turn people back to God, to turn people back to his righteousness, turn him back, turn people back to the person of Christ, and to do that all around the world, and to bring restoration, to prepare the way for, for the Christ's second coming, so that people can endure the day of his coming, so the church can endure the day of his coming. Uh, so it's an, it's an end time anointing, and it's not only on one person, it's on a company of people that will be used uh, in uh, the end times. Um, now, I want to now um, just, this will take a few minutes, but just to close with this, because we're talking, I'm trying to support the point that I'm making that, that we're talking about end time forerunners anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah being made ready for the end times. It's an end time forerunner call. Um, and it's really beautifully illustrated in the lives of Elijah and Elisha 
and, Je- and King Jehu. And you could read it uh, in 2 Kings chapter 9 and probably some in chapter 10. And in that area of the scriptures, there's a, quite a bit there. You see a beautiful type and shadow uh, taking place in the lives of Elisha and some of his servants. And you remember Elisha was received the double portion of anointing that was on Elijah's life. And now he ushered in Jehu. And, and Jehu uh, is a, uh, it's a beautiful picture of Jehu. It's a, is a picture of the second coming uh, of Christ. Uh, and re- let me read this scripture verse. Uh, and and t- t- speaking to one of the uh, disciples of Elisha, and take the flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramioth Gilead. When you arrive there, search out Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and bid him arise from among his brothers and bring him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed you king over uh, Israel. Um, And so we see this beautiful parallel uh, that compares Jehu and uh, and Elisha uh, to Christ at his second coming. Let me just kind of read some of these parallels. And you can read, you can pick them out yourself in 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10 and some of those places. Jehu was anointed as king over Israel, and Christ will be declared king over the entire earth. You see that and in the notes, you have all the scripture references for these things. I won't read the scripture references, but they're in the notes. Uh, Jehu was a captain in Israel's army, and Jesus will return as King of kings and Lord of lords and the captain of the host. Jehu was given the assignment to destroy Jezebel and the entire house of Ahab. You shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of the servants of the Lord at the hands of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab, every male person, both bond and free in Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and about the house of Basha, the son of Ah Ahijah. The dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel. None uh, none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled, uh, and Christ will destroy. In the same way that it's prophesied about Jehu doing doing all these things, Christ will destroy the entire house of the Antichrist at his coming, at his coming, and will cause the destruction of Babylon, the great harlot, the mother of harlotries, to avenge the blood of the prophets and the saints. Same thing that, that Jehu is going to do with Elijah, uh, with uh, uh, the house of Ahab and Jezebel, Jesus is going to do with his company of people at his second coming. After anointing Jehu as king, here's another point. After anointing Jehu as king, they blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. When Christ comes, he will come with the sound of the trumpet. Uh, Jehu went immediately to kill Ahab's son, Joram, who was king of Israel at the time. He went with great urgency immediately upon the, being anointed as king and was accompanied by an army of the Lord. Christ will return with great zeal accompanied by the army to defeat the enemies of the people of God. Uh, another point. Jesus drew his bow with, Jehu drew his bo- bow with full strength to kill Joram and his body thrown into the property of Naboth where Ahab and Jezebel had stolen Naboth's vineyard and had Naboth killed. Christ will have the beast and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. Elijah prophesied that when Jehu killed the descendants of Ahab uh, and those killed would be eaten by the birds of heaven, when Christ returns, the birds of heaven will eat the flesh of the kings and the commanders. Jehu killed Ahaziah, the king of Judah, who had aligned himself with the house of Ahab. In comparison, Christ will kill at at his coming with the sword of his mouth the kings aligned with the beast. Joram, the son of Ahab, was killed by Jehu in Megiddo. The last battle, the Battle of Armageddon, will be fought in the Jezreel Valley where Megiddo is located. Armageddon, or actually Armageddon, literally means 
the Mount of Megiddo. Jehu had <clears throat> Jezebel thrown down from the upstairs window when she died and was eaten by the dogs, fulfilling the words spoken by Elijah that the body would become as dung spread over the land that she had stolen from Naboth. In a similar fashion, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, will be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. Sorry for all the reading, but too much to try to remember. After Jehu uh, killed Ahab's son and, and Jezebel, he went in and ate and drank. After the great battle, Christ will celebrate with his bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jehu killed the entire house of Ahab in Jezreel and in Samaria. Following his return, Christ will gather the nations for a time of judgment. All who followed the beast will be killed. Jehu completely eradicated Baal worship from the land by gathering all the priests, prophets, and worshipers of Baal in one place. Once gathered, he killed them all and burned all of their implements of worship and burned their temple. Once Christ returns, he will remove all false worship from the land. He will be the only one worship in the millennial kingdom and beyond. So we see all of these parallels between the anointing of Jehu by uh, Elijah, who then anointed Elisha, who then anointed one of his disciples, who anointed Jehu, who did all of this to Ahab and to Jezebel and to bring in uh, pu purity in, in the land, which is, Christ, which is a parallel of what Christ is doing. Now, the reason I pointed that out is just to kind of conclude this, t this teaching on the fact that we're talking about end-time forerunners anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah, just like Elisha was anointed with the spirit and power of Elijah. And his disciples were anointed in that way, and they ultimately ushered in Jehu, who is a type of Christ. And so that's the, 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 the allegory, the type, the, the shadow that, that reinforces all that we've been talking about, that we are talking here about end-time forerunners that will prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. So if you are questioned or you question yourself, how do we know it's an end time call and not just to this generation? These are the th things that I've used to support it. And I believe with all my heart that we are talking about an end time call. Forerunners anointed in these end times, which are now upon us, the days of Noah, and all that, that represents birth pangs of what's coming are upon us now. And God is raising up forerunners. Now Elijah, now the spirit and the power of Elijah is coming as a second uh, to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. Just like Elisha ushered in Jehu, the, the, those who have this anointing on their life, forerunners, which could very well be the whole remnant church by that point in time, in history will usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. These are where God is raising up a forerunner company in this hour, and it is end time forerunners who, what, regardless of how long it is, will be on the scene until the Lord returns to usher in the second coming of Christ. What a powerful invitation that we're all receiving. You know, just says of John the Baptist that he did not do any signs and wonders. He didn't do any of the external miracles. But he was called the greatest of all the prophets of that po until that point in time. And so it's a, it's a very honorable call that you are responding to. It's an end time call. It's a call to prepare the way for our Lord to come back to earth. Again, I've said yes to it, and for many years now I've said yes. And I know God is saying to you, yes, say yes, and to embrace the idea that it's an end time call. And also to be able to draw from some of these points, maybe not every one of them, but some of these points, so that when you are questioned, when you are asked, why do you, how do you know it's an end time call? You can support it from the scriptures. So dig in, 
study, get prepared. Um, you know, there was a, a phrase that was used in one of the old, one of the movies about baseball. I don't remember the name of the movie now, but it says, you, you, when you, if you'll build it, they will come. Uh, and if, so if you'll build your heart, build this ministry into your heart, God will open up doors for you to speak. It may only be to one or two or ten, or it may be to thousands. Who knows? But if you will just say yes, God will open up the doors uh, for you to use this call upon your life, whether it's in teaching, preaching, ministry, or intercession or worship, whatever it may be, evangelism, whatever it could be, God will use you if you will put, dig into it and prepare yourself for this. So let me pray. We'll close with that. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity, one, that you we're living in the end times, that you have chosen us worthy to be end time warriors. And we do once again say yes to that. We say yes to it. And we thank you, Father, that you are reinforcing to us the end time call of forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Help, our, help these teachings to sink into our hearts and use this company of people in mighty, mighty, powerful ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.